This is Breakthroughs, a podcast from Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. I'm Erin Spain, host of the show. In the past decade, no new drugs have been approved for the fatal brain cancer glioblastoma, but a team of Northwestern scientists are eager to change that with a new drug designed at Northwestern. An early clinical trial found that the drug, called NU0129, kills tumor cells in people with glioblastoma. This is the first time a nanotherapeutic has been shown to cross the blood-brain barrier and cause cell death. It is also the first time in the university's history that a drug that began as an initial concept in the lab was carried through preclinical research, FDA approval, and into clinical trials all within Northwestern. Dr. Priya Kumtaker led the recent Northwestern Medicine Robert H. Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center of Northwestern University phase zero clinical trial of this drug and is here with the results, which were recently published in Science Translational Medicine. She's an associate professor of neurology in the division of neuro-oncology and of medicine in the division of hematology and oncology. Thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Tell me about glioblastoma and the need for new drugs to treat this disease? Yeah, so glioblastoma is a primary brain tumor, highly malignant brain tumor. And and when we say primary brain tumor, we're talking about a tumor that originates in the brain itself, as opposed to secondary tumors that might metastasize to the brain from the rest of the body. So this is a tumor that originates in the brain itself. So it's it's a malignant, kind of aggressive overgrowth of the glial cells, which is how it gives its name, glioblastoma. And unfortunately, this is a tumor type with no cure right now for treatment. And the mainstay of our treatment right now in terms of standard of care revolves around radiation and a chemotherapy called temozolomide, as well as another therapy called tumor treating fields. And this therapy patients get in the first line setting or when they're diagnosed. But actually at recurrence for glioblastoma, while there are various tools and treatments that we use, there's there's no single standard of care as it's a very difficult to treat tumor. Well, why is it so difficult to treat? Yeah, it's a great question. I and mean, there are multiple reasons why why brain tumors as a whole, but specifically glioblastoma have difficulties. So the first and probably most important is the blood brain barrier. So this is a physical barrier that serves actually a great purpose at baseline for all of us. So the blood brain barrier protects the brain from toxins that we might come across or ingest. And under normal circumstances, that's great because we want to protect our brain. But when we want our brain to be and brain tumors to be exposed to the quote unquote toxins that are our therapies, the blood brain barrier doesn't allow us to do that. So that as a physical barrier for starters can be really difficult to get the right treatments to the right location to exert their effects. Besides just a physical barrier, there are other attributes that the glioblastoma tumors carry that also make it difficult to treat. So this includes that they're really heterogeneous, which means, you know, no two glioblastoma tumors are genetically the same. And so it makes it hard to have a single therapy that would work across all tumors, all glioblastoma tumors. And they can be heterogeneous or even different within a single patient's glioblastoma where one part of the growth is different than another part. So because of this heterogeneity, again, or diversity in genetics of the tumor, along with the blood-brain barrier, makes it very difficult to treat these tumors. Well, and that's one of the reasons why the results of this study are so exciting. And we're going to dive deeper into the background of this study and the North big Northwestern connection here momentarily. But first, explain the main findings of this study about this drug, which was able to go past that blood-brain barrier. One, we learned that when, when we gave this drug, to patients that it was safe and well tolerated. But beyond that, we learned that this drug really got to the right place. It got to where we needed it to go, which is, as we mentioned previously, one of the biggest barriers in treating this this tumor type. So it was able to traverse that blood-brain barrier and get to tumor. That's one of the main findings of this study. Another is this is a drug, again, that's never been given to humans previously to this. We had a lot of animal studies that was also included on this publication. But this is the first time that we gave it to our patients, to people. And so we really needed to evaluate the safety of this compound as well. And we found that it was very safe. And and we saw no toxicity in our patients. So 
patients tolerated it well, which is really important because not only do we want a drug that does the that attacks tumors, we don't want it to attack our patients. You know, we want them to have good quality of life with whatever treatment they're given. What's also really important that we found in this study is not only did drug get to the right place, but even at these small doses that we gave on study, it had the intended effect. So what we were looking for was an effect on tumor cells. And we were looking for, this is kind of a big science word, but apoptosis, which is essentially programmed cell death. And what we were looking for were tumor cells to show more signs of apoptosis or that kind of program cell death or sort of cell suicide. And we looked for markers that indicate that tumor cells are undergoing apoptosis. And we found that indeed with this treatment, those apoptotic markers increase. If I had to boil this down to two main findings, I would say one, we were really happy to see that drug got safely to the location we needed it to, which is the tumor without hurting patients. And two, we found that the drug created the intended effects that we were hoping it to with that program cell death of tumor cells. And again, this is a nanotherapeutic. And in your role at Northwestern, you lead many clinical trials in metastatic disease, but this nanotherapeutic drug NU0129 is quite different. Um, explain why is this trial unique and how did the development of this trial unfold here at Northwestern? This phase zero study, while it was small and only included eight patients, was really revolutionary and it really took years in the making for it to come to fruition. And this is the work of so many scientists on the Northwestern campus, including in, at the International Institute of Nanotechnology, where many scientists, including Dr. Sieg, who's the senior author of the paper, and many others really led the development of this unique compound. There are multiple levels of uniqueness of the study. The compound itself, the design of it, the technology behind it is very unique. The idea that a compound can be created on an academic campus and then carried through all the way into clinical trials without the need of a third-party pharmaceutical partner is quite unique. And then also the findings that we had were very unique on this study as well, and hopefully technology that we can use in the future. Because again, to reiterate, you know, glioblastoma affects 13 to 15,000 patients a year. And as you said, it's uniformly fatal. And there's been no new drugs approved for glioblastoma in the past decade. So aside from what you just said, how, you know, this is sort of a, a new class of drugs, it's uh, something that we've been able to develop here at Northwestern. Just the fact that there could be another drug for glioblastoma on the horizon, that has to mean a lot for folks like you who treat these patients and for patients and families. Absolutely. I mean, this is what we fight for every day. This is why I come to work is to fight for these patients and, and families, just as you've said. And, and I think we're so lucky to have so many dedicated people on the Northwestern campus who are really fighting for the same. So this phase zero study, tell me about it. There was eight patients enrolled through the Lurie Cancer Center who had reoccurrent glioblastoma. Tell me about, well, you said they're given a very small dose of medication. How was it administered? And you know what were you hoping to achieve again early on with this study? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we always typically start phase zero studies are really small studies because we want to really evaluate the safety. So that's why we had eight patients on study. So the workflow of it is patients who had recurrent glioblastoma would, who were going to undergo surgical resection of that brain tumor would come to the hospital before their surgery. They received this drug one time as an IV or in their vein dosed drug. And then about a day later, they would undergo the surgery. So during the surgery, the tumor would be removed and we would take that tumor out for analysis. So we did various analyses of that tumor, including looking at how much of the drug got physically to that tumor site or what we call bioavailability did drug get to where we needed it to? And then two, we looked at, again, did the drug carry out the intended effects that we wanted it to? So that's what we looked at in the tumor. And then what did we look at with the patients? Well, we followed the patients after they were treated on a weekly basis. We wanted to ensure that, again, not only did the drug work, but we wanted to ensure that the patients 
didn't have any unwanted side effects from these drugs. So we would monitor them weekly. And we only enrolled one patient at a time because we, of course, wanted it to be as safe as possible for the patients enrolled. So with each patient completing that safety period of monitoring, when they would complete that, we then en enrolled the next patient and sequentially then got to eight patients that we were able to collect data on. Tell me about those first few patients when you examined their tumors and you could see that the drug did in fact have an impact. What was your reaction? Yeah, I mean, excitement, I would say in one word. I represent one of many people on a team of people behind this study that were really invested in its outcome and invested in the patients. And so we were collectively excited to work in brain tumors and brain tumor research. There is a sense of idealism that we all must have, because if you look at the statistics and, and see how many studies are positive, it can be, can be a downer at times. So to see that it was positive with the effects that we wanted, that it was getting to drug, that it was getting to the tumor, that, it, that patients were being safe, that, you know, we could see the effects. We were excited. And I think at that point, we knew that there was something to this technology. Tell me a little bit more about nanotherapeutics and SNA, this drug platform, which was invented here at Northwestern that was used in the study. Just give me some background on this drug platform. SNA stands for spherical nucleic acid, which is basically the genetic material. You might know this as DNA or RNA. The nanoparticle in this therapeutic Basically what it looks like is, it kind of looks like a koosh ball where it has a core and then glued to that core all around are in numerous SNAs or these short strands, kind of almost like curly cues of, of DNA and RNA nucleic material that are tightly arranged around this ball. And that small ball with kind of a halo of genetic material is then able to cross the blood brain barrier and exert its effects. So that center ball where all the spheric nucleic acid um, is attached to, that ball can be made of various structures. So specifically for this phase zero study, we designed it with that center core with the shell around it. So that center core was made of gold. And so what we were able to do because it was made of gold was to trace it and to trace where in the tumor it went to. So it was a really appropriate structure to measure what we intended to measure, which was, did the drug get to the tumor? Okay. So the core was made of gold and the outside, the nucleic acid that was attached to it that's that's the nucleic acid or the spherical nucleic acid that we then hope would get to the tumor's nucleic acid and the tumor's building machinery, if you will, and change the genetics and change the behavior of the brain tumor. So what's next for this drug now that there's been this phase zero study you've shown in humans that it can be tolerated, that it actually worked? Um, what's next for glioblastoma? Could this be used for other diseases as well? So definitely this technology can be used in a variety of settings, both in the brain and outside of the brain. A lot of that work is happening right here on the Northwestern campus at the International Institute of Nanotechnology. For the brain specifically, and for brain tumors specifically, what we hope to do is to move this technology forward of having this tightly packed spheric nucleic acid and compounds that contain that, we're hoping to use that technology to design treatments in brain tumors and move those treatments to phase one studies and so on. So what's next? What else will you be able to use it for in future clinical trials? I really think that the sky is the limit for this technology. Um, it can be used in the brain and outside the brain. For brain tumors specifically, which is my passion, I definitely think that we can change the way tumors behave by delivering genetic material to them that in influence its behavior. So I'm really excited to see what we can do in the brain tumor world. But far beyond that, I'm excited to see that we have therapeutics that can reach the brain. That could have a plethora of implications, including in the world of degenerative diseases, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease, anything where we need to get drug to reach the brain effectively. I think that there's much more to be had on the horizon. Well, wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show and explaining this technology and the results of this trial. It is truly exciting to see all that's happening with nanotherapeutics at Northwestern. Well, I'm truly encouraged by the work that's highlighted in this publication and 
we are really excited to share our work through this science and translational medicine publication. But really what I want to end with is just highlighting our patients who enrolled on this study, all eight of them, um, and including their, their family and their caretakers who have trusted us with their care. They are the reason, patients like them are the reason why the science moves forward. Patients who are willing to enroll in studies and willing to volunteer themselves to move the science forward is something that we will always be indebted to. If you enjoy our podcast, go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to shows to rate and review us and subscribe so that you never miss an episode. Thanks for listening.